Okay, so now I'm gonna go into the proposed revisions in the PAP guide, but what this section moves into is more into the NSPM 33 disclosure um, requirements. Um, NSF and NIH, as you all know, or I hope you know, have been collaborating for multiple years to see where our agencies were consistent or where we were not on the biographical sketch and current and pending support formats. Um, we then began focusing on where the differences were and whether it was possible to eliminate or mitigate these differences to help eliminate the administrative burden on researchers. Now, let me, let me uh, state that this is really important because it, when you looked at the language, the requirements translated a lot from one agency to the next, but different words were used in many cases. And the community made it very clear that, yeah, we get that there's, there is harmonization, but by virtue of using those different words, that makes it really complicated for uh, the community to understand. So, um, we also chose, um, we've also, NSF, NIH, and OSTP also co chair um, an interagency working group on disclosure policies. Um, and this is, um, th there was in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance a harmonized disclosure table and a paragraph seven that went into more detail on. Uh, the disclosure requirements. Um, where I think we're going to be going more in this in the future is a format that is more closely aligned with what NSF and NIH have used and that you'll see in um, another few slides that really is at a much more detailed um, level. Um, and I think that will be very, very helpful for your faculty. Uh, we also are working on develop, uh, development of standardized data elements, instructions, and templates that would be a harmonized biographical sketch and current and pending support section um, that could be used by um, all agencies. Um, again, uh, this um, is something that's in process. Uh, we have developed the format, uh, a draft format for the biographical sketch at an interagency level and a draft uh, current and pending support. That would um, uh, be very, very helpful, I think, for all of you. The challenge for NSF is that we're putting out a new PAP guide, and the new PAP guide is going to have a a template, if you will, for the biographical sketch and for current and pending support. But yet these harmonized versions federal wide have not even been put out for public comment yet. So that makes it very, very complicated for NSF um, because our timing is just simply off. Um, and so we are going to be going as closely as possible to what will be in the draft harmonized formats. Um, I can tell you we know a bit about this. We literally have gone through over 250 comments from um, our federal agency um, colleagues um, on these harmonized formats. And there is definitely a desire by OSTP that they go through a public comment process. Well, NSF has agreed to serve as the steward of these formats. So that means we will be posting these interagency formats for public comment in the Federal Register in the very, very near future. We will then have to work to resolve all the comments received. And then we will, thank you, Samantha Hunter up front, develop a page which will have the official versions of these documents, including the tables that the disclosure tables that um, actually evolve over time. 
So uh, we will be replacing then the disclosure tables and the NSPM implementation guidance to be more detailed and formatted. But up until the time these documents are issued, you need to continue to use the requirements specified by the Federal Research Funding Agency. And I'll be showing those in a couple slides, actually the next slide. So we've also added a new section on NSF disclosure requirements in the PAP guide that identifies how NSF collects disclosure information for senior personnel. For NSF, that's our collaboration and other affiliation, the biographical sketch, and current and pending support. Next slide, please. So speaking again of the table, this is the current NSF pre-award and post-award disclosure table relating to the biographical set and current and pending support. And it's actually more. So what this table does, it's four pages in length, is that it has a, a, a column for uh, a type of activity. And that could be, um, uh, at, at, and we have made this at very, very, detailed levels based on the many questions that have been asked. We have across, um, across uh, the top bar where in the proposal that you would put it, the biographical sketch, the current and pending support, and yes, even in one case, facilities, equipment, and other resources. We've also included project reports and the post-award term and condition. And we have a very important last column said disclosure not required. Now we have on occasion received um, comments from the community that say we disagree with not having to provide that information. NSF would never object if you decide that you feel it's something important to disclose for a particular faculty member or the faculty member wants to disclose it. No one has ever had issues with over-reporting in this topical area. So we have definitely tried with this table to remove the administrative burden by making researchers aware of the parameters set by the agency. Now I'm gonna put a call out for a box on here. All projects, and it's highlighted in a big red, all projects, including this project, currently under consideration from whatever source, and all ongoing projects, irrespective of whether support is provided through the proposing organization, another organization, or directly to the individual. Every single word in here is important. But a lot, a lot of faculties forget this project, and they say, well, why am I putting this project on there? Because NSF uses this information, um, the uh, current and pending support, to assess the, um, whether the individual has the capacity to carry out the research as proposed, as well as any overlap or duplication with funding activities. So including this project is vitally important. Next slide, please. This is the second um, page of this template. Um, uh, I am calling out uh, the in-kind contributions that are not intended for use on the project and, or proposal being proposed to NSF and have an associated time commitment must be reported. And there is, and we continue to receive questions on that particular um, type of activity. Next slide, please. Um, this is the third page of the slide. And on this one, you're gonna start seeing a lot of disclosure not required. Um, and we continue to get questions on organizational startup packages. Organizational startup packages provided to the individual from the proposing organization are not required to be reported to NSF. So next slide, please. So that those slides constitute what is currently in place. We um, have those on our webpage and um, literally have archived older versions so that you will know what's in place at any one time or date 
by the date on the top of that uh, particular um, disclosure table. Now I'm going to go into another aspect of our uh, implementation guidance, um, and that is um, NSF uh, disclosures and update and correction requirements. So NSF pre and post award requirements for disclosures and corrections are as follows. At the time of proposal submission, um, the all senior personnel identified on the project will have to provide collaborators and other affiliations. That is a single copy document only to help us manage the review process, a biographical sketch and current and pending support. Per NSPM 33, prior to making an award, you um, individuals that, uh, I mean, the individuals that are being considered for an award that will be requested by an NSF program officer, and this is, a, again, a, a funding level of across the foundation of like 23%, it's a much, much, much smaller than the proposer community will be requested to provide updated current and pending support. Um, prior uh, to the award being made. After, prior to the funding decision, I'm sorry, I need to correct myself. And then after an award is made, NSF's requirements are as follows. And there's a lot of com uh, miscommunication and folklore. Post-award requirements are as follows. Um, the a if the AOR discovers that a disclosure that should have been submitted at the time of proposal submission, but was not, they have 30 days to submit a post-award request to NSF. We are currently in the process in this PAP guide. Presently, you submit them as another requ an other request, but we are changing that um, and making it um, its own distinct post-award request because the current other request does not have adequate space to provide all the information that needs to be reported. Now, let me tell you where the confusion is here. Um, this is, again, if the disclosure should have been submitted at the time of proposal submission, but was not, they have 30 days to submit a post-award request to NSF. I have gotten lots of requests at conferences and the like of, oh, this means if I got new support from um, uh, and some entity after the award is made, I have 30 days to notify NSF and I use this particular post-award request to do so. That is not accurate. This particular, the term and condition applies to um, something that was should that should have been provided but was not. In terms of how you update or how faculty update their information, at the time of project reporting, PIs and co-PIs must specify whether there is new active other support and if it's been received in their annual and final project reports. If yes, they have to attach an updated current and pending support document. Um, and so that is how NSF is collecting new support received after an award is made. There are other big agencies out there, I'm not going to name any names, but that require you to provide any um, new other support uh, and identify that to the agency within 30 days. That is not NSF. What you see on this slide is uh, where NSF is um, going on this issue. Now, the last bullet is very important because NSPM 33 didn't direct agencies, but it encouraged agencies to uh, consider use of just-in-time uh, for um, uh, submission of current and pending support. And we have and continue Every time these new types of requirements come out or encouragements come out to reassess that. And we are in the process of doing just that. We are taking this very seriously. 
Um, the only thing I could uh, continue to say is that this, if it were to be implemented, would be in a future iteration of the PAP guide. There would not be time to get it into the 2023 version. And equally important, folks have to recognize, and we hear this all the time, but NIH does it. Well, and, and we highly respect NIH and the policies and procedures they use, but their review process is actually quite different than our review process. They have a two-tier review process. We have a one-tier review process. They have a center for scientific review. We have individual program officers. So all of that has to be factored into any decision. But once NSF has made a decision, we will certainly make this um, a very important part of our communication to the community. Now, the only reason that I'm included in this, this was a solicitation that NSF put on the street for research security training for the US research uh, community. And the goal of this was uh, to um, strengthen research security at institutions. And we partnered with NIH, DOE, and DOE um, to try to find a balanced approach to research security. And this includes the development and implementation of training to help institutions meet NSPM 33 requirements. So the deadline for this solicitation is passed. These proposals, even though the deadline was May 23rd, these proposals that came in have already been reviewed. They were done in extreme quick form, rapid form. And we specified four areas. Why is research security an important issue? What is a disclosure policy and how will it be used? What actions can federally funded research recipients take to manage and mitigate risk? And is uh, international collaboration encouraged? So, uh, stay tuned. Um, I uh, would love to have been able to tell you uh, more information on those awards, but they are still in process. So unfortunately, I'm not able to do that. But this is extremely, these training modules will be very, very important in helping to meet the research security training program requirements that talk about training of your faculty and staff. So um, I look forward to sharing um, a lot more information with you about that.